I can't begin until I say that Rita and I are so very honored uh, to be a part of this gathering. Thank you for answering God's call. Those who have worked so hard to make this three-day event possible, for those of you, you who carry out the fourth day in profound ways and have said to God, I will be a part of the Via de Cristo movement and I will move this forward in such a way that lives are changed forever. So let me just say thank you for the way in which you allow God to use you over and over again. Many times I know that lives are changed. You see it on the weekend, and then you may not have a chance to know just how profound the movement really is. But it's changed the lives of many people in North Carolina. On behalf of the pastors in North Carolina, let me say to you, thank you for your work and your ministry. It is marvelous to just sit back or stand back or participate in some way and see God's Spirit at work. Let us pray. <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Holy Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Jesus Christ our Lord. We believe, Lord, that you are here present. Although our eyes do not see you, our faith senses you. Take any stray thoughts from our minds. Make us understand the truths which you wish to teach us. Your servants are listening. Speak, Lord, to our souls. Amen. I'm Leonard Bolick. I attended Western North Carolina Via de Cristo Mix No. 2 in the summer of 1993, where I was honored and blessed to sit at the table of St. John. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, no one comes to the Father but by me. We're going to be thinking a lot these next three days about John, the 14th chapter, and how Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Marvelous words from Christ our Lord, and they come from this gospel of St. John. St. John's a special gospel. It in some ways stands alone. 90% of what's in the gospel of John is in no other place in all of Scripture. This is what Martin Luther said about the gospel of St. John. He said, it's to be preferred over the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because in John you know everything that you need to know about Christ. It is the Word made flesh. Jesus is the Word. Jesus came and dwelt among us. The early church had symbols for the various Gospels. The symbol for St. John is an eagle. In St. John, the Gospel, the Word of Jesus, literally soars in ways that it doesn't seem to soar in Matthew Mark, and Luke. Well, the 14th chapter of John, it's a powerful section of John. It's where in John there seems to be a transition from what Jesus did earlier on to the last week. In fact, the last part of John, the last half of John, has to do with those final days, those final seven days of Jesus. Jesus is with the disciples, and Jesus seems troubled. But then Jesus, even though he's troubled, he knows what's coming, he begins to talk to the disciples about what's happening. Jesus is talking to the disciples about what is going to be their fourth day, 
what is going to be our fourth day. So let's see what Jesus has to say. He says to those disciples and to you and to me, don't be troubled, believe in me, we're going to be together forever, I'm going to go away, you're going to come a little bit later. And that, as Pastor Reggie already pointed out, really threw Thomas. Probably none of the disciples there understood what he was talking about. So many times, Jesus has a week left, and they still don't understand. So Thomas says, well, we'd like to go with you, but we don't quite understand what you're talking about. You're talking about going with you, coming later. Could you say a little more about it? And Jesus uses the question from Thomas, the doubting of Thomas, and Thomas is never an atheist. He's just trying to believe. He's just having trouble. So Jesus says to Thomas and to the disciples and to you and to me, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Then Jesus says, you're going to do some really great things. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father might be glorified. Then he reminds them he's going to be leaving, the Holy Spirit's going to be coming, and he said, let's be on our way. And then in that process, Jesus celebrates Holy Communion. They break bread, they celebrate the Passover. Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. And then he washes their feet, and he tells us, why Scripture's written. That's pretty profound. He said, we wrote this. We put this book together so you'll believe and so you'll be saved. So Scripture's there to create faith so that we might live with Jesus forever. Well, this Gospel of John, fascinating book, and John often has Jesus saying, I am. We're going to work our way toward it, but at the end, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus says other things. He said, I am the bread of life. And if you come to me, you're never going to be hungry again. We pray in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus says, I'm going to give you those things that you really do need. Maybe not all that you want, but I will give you those things that you need, and I'm going to be the bread of life for you. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You're not going to be in darkness because I'm going to bring light. The light shows us where we are and who we are. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. Jesus, our Lord, walks ahead of the sheep to guide and direct and protect. And ultimately, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's you and me. And then Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. At night, the shepherd would put the sheep in a fold and the shepherd would be there at the gate so that they couldn't get away and nothing could come in. So Jesus is the gate. We go through Jesus to be with him and with God forever. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Those who believe, even if they die, will live. The Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't agree. The Pharisees thought there was life after death. The Sadducees did not. But Jesus is here very clear saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Through Jesus we have life eternal. Jesus said, I am the true vine. The vine was a symbol for Israel. They had faltered, but Jesus is the vine, gives his life, the vine 
is supported or supports the grapes. So the vine gives life to us so that we might work in the world. And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't say, I'm one way, I am a bit of truth, and I am some kind of life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, I'd like to think with you a bit about the way, the truth, and the life, and connect that, at least I'm going to try to do this, to connect that to piety, study, and action. You see, I think Jesus here is with the disciples talking about the fourth day. How do we live the faith? We spend three days in a Via de Cristo weekend, and then we have the rest of our lives to be a part of that fourth day. First of all, I am the way. The psalmist prayed, Teach me your way, O Lord. I remember some years ago, I was trying, before the days of GPS, I was trying to get from Lenore, North Carolina, to Asheville, North Carolina, and somehow get to the little town of Morganton. Well, it's fairly complex if you've never done that before. So I was on my CB, and I contacted a trucker, and I said, what's the best way to get through Morganton? He said, well, it's really hard to explain it. He said, if we could connect and you could follow me, he said, I could take you, and it would just be so easy. So he told me the color of his truck. I told him the color of my car. We found each other, and I just followed him right through Morganton and still use that same route today. It is the best way to get through Morganton. Jesus says, I'm not going to tell you how to go. I'm going to take you by the hand. It's very personal. It's a relationship. And this way has to do with our piety. So we look at Scripture. There is the Old Testament that tells us about the coming of Jesus. There's the New Testament that's the fulfillment of that promise where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're claimed by our Lord in holy baptism. Isn't it marvelous before a child can call God by name, God calls the child by name. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In our Lutheran church, we believe that the child doesn't have to do anything. It's what God has done in Christ. And God is the actor. If you'll notice, our text for this weekend is what Jesus is about. I am the way and the truth and the life. In Scripture, it's always what God does first, and then we respond to what God has done in Jesus through the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit gives to us that gift of faith. And it's Holy Communion. That's part of the way. We gather at the table of God. And Christ our Lord comes to us in and under and through the bread and the wine. That's a mystery. We believe that Christ is truly present. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. I like to believe that that table of God goes through eternity. And when we were communing a while ago, I like to think, that people who have gone before were there with us at God's table, receiving Christ himself. My favorite movie of all time is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I've probably seen that movie a hundred times. And if this weekend, if if Christ doesn't come, I may see it one more time this weekend. It's a story of Indiana Jones and his father, Indiana Jones Sr., as they're looking for the Holy Grail, this cup that was used by Jesus our Lord at the Last Supper. 
And in what is to me the most moving part of that movie, Indiana Jones Sr. is wounded. It's very clear he's going to die. And Indiana Jones Jr. finds what he thinks is the cup used by Jesus. So, in this big cavern, Indiana Jones Jr. takes this cup, which he thinks is the the chalice used by our Lord, gets some water and runs outside and pours it onto his father's chest where he's been wounded. And he is miraculously healed. On the way out of the movie, a little boy, the first time I saw it, the a little boy said to what appeared to be his mother, is there really a cup like that? I don't know what she said, but I wonder up to the little boy and say, yes, <laughs> there's a cup like that. It's a cup that is available to us, and it brings about healing in this world and in the next. So part of the way... Part of the piety has to do with Scripture and holy baptism. It has to do with holy communion. It has to do with prayer as we speak and as we listen to God. Jesus said, I am the truth. The psalmist said, teach me your way and I will walk in your truth. The Old Testament gives us truth about what is to come. The New Testament tells us about Jesus, the birth of Jesus. We see Jesus at the age of 12 in the temple. We see Jesus telling stories of the faith. We see Jesus healing. We see the suffering and the death and the resurrection and the promise of Jesus to come again. It has to do with truth. It has to do with study. We study to learn the truth, and the truth is Jesus. My mother and dad, Homer and Naoma, grew up in a small community about two hours north from here. Bailey's Camp is the name of the place, between Happy Valley and Blowing Rock. And they attended St. Mark's Lutheran Church, which was just in the community. They grew up together. And at St. Mark's Lutheran Church, they learned about Jesus. That's where they were baptized. That's where they were confirmed. That's where they went to Sunday school. That's where they were baptized, as I said. That's where they were married. It's where they most likely fell in love. It's where their only son was baptized. And it was a very special place. My dad was Sunday school superintendent for 61 years. My mother played the organ there for 73 years. Well, the time came... And you might know, I've already guessed this, but there were only on good Sundays did we have double figures. It was a very small, small place. A little bark church on the side of the mountain. But the time came when my father wasn't able to go to church. Now, he could see the church from his window in the den, but he couldn't get there. So he and our neighbor Marcus built a little altar over in the corner of the den. And it looked pretty much like the altar at St. Mark's. It had holy, holy, holy across the front. It had alleluia. It had a pyramid. He didn't change the pyramids, but it had one pyramid. Had candles. And in the summertime, it had flowers. Had the family Bible in the center. And at night, before Dad went to bed, he would always stop by the altar and read from Scripture. And the Scripture was always opened to the book of John, normally the third chapter, and John 3, 16 was underlined. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that those who believe in Him might never die but live forever. So I said one day to Dad, 
why do you always have the Bible open to that particular text? And why is that text underlined? And he said, well, that particular scripture passage has changed the way I live. It's helped me understand God's love for me. Well, a few years ago, Dad said to Mother, I don't feel real well. As he was walking by that altar, he collapsed, lost consciousness, was taken to the hospital, and the next day he passed away. But before he died, we gathered there in the hospital room. We read John 3.16. We sang some hymns, and we prayed. He always said he didn't want to be lying in state at the funeral home, so the night before his funeral, we took him to the church. That's what he wanted. And we received friends in the church. And then he and Mother and I spent the night together there in the church. And the Bible that night was open at John 3.16. The next day we had the worship service. And that was the text for the funeral. The pastor reflected on that text. And we celebrated his faith. And we used that text throughout because Dad said it had changed the way he lived. I'm here to tell you it changed the way he died and the way he lives even now. So his baptism is complete, and he is with the Lord forever. Jesus said, I am the truth, and I would say that we as a part of the fourth day are seeking that truth, and we're a part of study. So Jesus says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. The psalmist said, you will show me the path of life. It is Jesus alone that gives life. The way and the truth through Jesus lead to the life. In him. Marvelous story. <clears throat> Frank Hayes was 35 years old. He lived in Brooklyn, New York, and for many years he had trained horses for the steeplechase there in that particular town. That's an equestrian obstacle course where horses are ridden by people and they jump over hedges and walls and ditches filled with water. And Frank's goal in life had been to ride a horse, to be a jockey. But it just wasn't something that had ever happened. And he always, not always, but would often ask the owner of these horses he trained, could he ride a horse in a race? Finally, when he was 35 years old, his employer gave him a chance to ride. It was on July the 4th, and he was riding the horse named Sweet Kiss. And it was at Belmont Park. Frank had never ridden a horse before. It was a big deal. So Frank and Sweet Kiss in the race, two-mile race, at the end of the first mile, they were ahead. And in the last turn... When the horse swerved just a bit, almost ran into another horse, people wondered what had happened. The horse seemed to recover, and Sweet Kiss and Frank won that race by a half length. It happened in that last turn when Sweet Kiss swerved just a bit and almost hit the other horse. That's when Frank's head dropped down on the mare's neck. And Frank never lifted his head again, and they crossed the finish line. Frank had had a fatal heart attack. Never before or since in horse racing has a rider tasted victory in death. But it happens in the church all the time. <laughs> Holy baptism is the sweet kiss of God's love. We are here to celebrate this weekend a lot of things, but ultimately, bottom line, 
we're celebrating our Lord's victory over sin, death, and the devil. The Lamb that was slain has begun His reign, and we ride the victory on the waters of holy baptism in the arms of Jesus our Lord. I grew up, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned, right near Blowing Rock, <clears throat> up in the mountains, and an author lived there for a number of years, Jan Karen, and she wrote the Mitford series. And she uses Blowing Rock as the little town of Mitford as a, a kind of a, an idealistic place. One of her books, Out of Cana, is a fascinating story of Harley and Father Tim and Dooley and Lace, and they're all together, and Dooley has just received a gift. It's a picture of Jesus holding a lamb. You've perhaps seen the picture. Well, Dooley asks Father Tim, the Episcopal priest, what does this mean? So Father Tim says to him, well, you tell me what you think it means. So Dooley, who's just received the picture, said, I know what it means. It means if you have a hundred sheep and you lose one and you find it, you feel really good about it. And the little girl, Lace, said, let me tell you what I think it means. She said, I think it means that when somebody's lost and Jesus finds them and they give their heart to Jesus, Jesus is really happy. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We respond to what God has done in Christ our Lord as way, truth, and life through our piety and our study and our actions. God loves you, and so do I.